It is. It is real. It's true though. We love looking at. We love. We love looking at dumpster fires of situations. Car videos I've seen. I am really. Yeah, I am really always worried about car accidents. So first off, I just should preface this by saying that um, that I worked in a in a psychology lab uh, when I was an undergraduate researcher. Um, it was a joint computer science. Uh, it was a joint computer science lab and um, a psychology lab. That's a field of research called human-computer interaction. It's, it's all about how do computers help humans and how can humans use computers better. Uh, this one specifically was dedicated to helping the visually impaired. But once you get your PhD, you really, uh, and there were a lot of PhDs in that lab. I did not have a PhD at that point. Um, you really learn how to branch out and read other stuff. So. You know, the things like uh, where you have Bruce Banner and the Avengers having seven PhDs doesn't really make sense because you get your PhD and you just do stuff. You, you publish papers at that point. That, that's, that's, that's how you rate yourself as, uh, that's how you have like a, a bunch of, uh, that's how you basically set world records there, I guess. Um, but regardless, um, the lab, I remember them over uh, talking about basically humans and drivers. It's not that like some people are bad drivers. It's that everybody is a bad driver, and it's just whether or not you recognize it. So everybody's a bad driver because humans have a tendency to become complacent, and, and basically if something is normal to us, then it's normal, and then we, don't, then we stop paying attention to it. So that's why it's very easy to get into the zone or to just not pay attention while driving. So everybody's a bad driver, I'm a bad driver, you're a bad driver, everybody is, and if you just recognize that fact and remind yourself of that fact while you're driving, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a bit safer for you to drive. Okay, so, so let me go ahead and start with actual stuff. So, but regardless, if you wanna learn more about HCI or other research areas of computers, right, or like anything, or any questions about the way, like, you know, the, the way things above getting a bachelor's degree work, please can come and talk to me. I, I'd be happy to tell you all the stuff you need to know about that. Um, a master's from, and this is a thing I heard 15 years ago, so it may not be, rel it may not here anymore. That can equate to about a $20,000 extra starting salary for computer science, but that was something I heard like in here say like a while ago. It may have changed by now. It doesn't hurt, especially, and we also offer a five plus one program. Oh, sorry, four plus one program here. So, uh, meaning you do more stuff here, but uh, but you get out with a master's, which is never bad. Um, the person to talk to the, in that case would be um, would be Professor Tony Hughes um, or Anthony Hughes. Um, He's the one with the British accent, uh, so, um, and he handles a lot of the graduate stuff. So he'd be a person to talk to if you want to know about the official way that Temple does it. But master's is, is never a bad option, um, especially if the economy crashes right as you graduate, like it did for me. But, um, or if you've, um, the PhD is really only necessary if you want to do, uh, you know, a lot of research and, and or you want to do what I'm doing, which is going into academia. Um, I don't do a lot of research. I teach, and I enjoy teaching. So, um, all right, speaking of teaching, let me do that. So, one of your, so let's talk about problem four in your exercises, right? Um, so that was the is permutation. So given a bunch of things, I'd like to have, I'd like to get a permutation of, I'd like to check if those two things are permutations. So given a list A, list B, check if list A and list B are permutations. All right, now I said that this one was a bit, was definitely the, one, the hardest one, and I want to show you kind of why. Um, I mentioned that there were two ways to solve it, one of which was going through and counting all the occurrence, going through each item and counting the number of times it occurs in one, and then counting the number of times it occurs in the other. And just keep doing that until you get a mismatch. The other way to solve it is by sorting. Um, so if you sort, 
and if you sort two things, if they're permutations of each other, they'll be equal. Okay, um, so let's do that one because that one sounds simpler. And I mean, it is if you know how to do it in Java, which is the trick. So I'll just kind of show, kind of. so how do you sort things automatically in Java without having to resort to writing your own sorting method, which sounds like, that's a ter which sounds like it's terrible. Uh, we'll be doing that later in the semester, but, but with a twist, because you know, I simply tell you that all the sorting algorithms are, are online, I want you to just modify them. So, um, if I've got a list E, sorry, let's go with a list of integers, okay? And it's got, um, we'll just call it list new array list, boom, boom. No, not new array. Array list. S silly, silly IntelliJ. You're always trying to be helpful, but sometimes you're just not helpful in the right way. Okay, let's get rid of that class. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead for uh, for I. Hit, I'm going to hit tab, and I'm going to start with. Uh, I'm going to start with um, let's say ten. And I'm just going to create a reverse sorted list. So while it's greater than or equal to zero. And always remember when you're reversing it and you have that plus plus there, you want to send it to minus, otherwise you're gonna have a bad time with an infinite loop. Okay, and all I'm gonna do is do list dot add i. I could have done it increasingly by just like doing 10 minus i for you know adding 10 minus i and then just done a standard loop, but I didn't think about that until now. So okay. So and let's go ahead and print our list. Right? And remember, whatever ha when we when we do a print line like this, just keep in mind what happens is that it is what happens is that it's trying to convert it to a string. And what happens is that in order to do that, it calls the built-in method to string, which is built into everything. And so that automatically happens. List dot string automatically gets called, and it automatically produces our our list for us. So just keep that in mind. It's never actually necessary to do to string in Java, in the sense that you never actually have to call it. It's one of those useful things um, that I like about Java that Python does not actually do, and I love Python. So see, it's a it's it's sort in reverse. So let's go ahead and sort this. Now, if you did some research, you may have found out that there is this awesome method called collections. Dot sort. Collections is a is a package in, in, in util which deals with collections, which are essentially our data structures. Pretty much anything that is a data structure we're learning is going to have, is, is a type of collection. But coll what is a collection? It's basically any object that's made up of a bunch of objects. Um, so this one has, so collections, much like arrays, has a bunch of methods that help with this. So collections.sort list. And we'll learn that basically that this, there's actually multiple sorting method, uh, techniques built in, um, quick sort and, and tim sort specifically. But I can never remember which one does which. I think it's just quick sort for primitives. Yeah, it's quick sort for primitives. But anyway, you can see that it sorts it. Great. OK, so we've learned how to use collections.sort, right? You just toss your list inside of it, and it sorts it for you. That's awesome. So let's go ahead and, and do this. Public, static. Oh wait, no, I have to be in, I'm like, the, the indent seems wrong. What am I doing wrong? Public, static. Part of the issue when you teach both Python and, um, and Java is that like you try doing something you would do in another language. Public static Boolean um, is permutation. And I'll need a, and I'm recording this, and I can, if I was running this in Zoom, I could send it out in chat, but that's, I can always just post this code, and I can always paste this in, the, in Discord, you know, or upload it. But anyway, but yeah, I would keep writing. So public list, so I'll just simply say A, list E, B, 
Awesome. And now we need to define that E is not actually a class that it can't find. So right now, what with those E's, what it's doing is saying, I'm, I'm getting an error because it's saying, I'm looking for a class named E. Did you write a class called E? Because I don't have one built into me. I can't find it. So what I'm doing here is saying, no, 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 E isn't actually a class. That's just a placeholder for whatever class I'm going to pull in. And Jot was like, oh, OK, E is a E is some kind of object. Got it, got it, got it, got it. OK, so I'm going to, so when you're doing like these Boolean methods, it's always good to assume one thing and then try to disprove it. So it's very easy to assume that something is not a permuta is a permutation, right? And then disprove it otherwise, right? Just by showing that there's a mismatch or, or something. So, and I always like to put something in because I, I always want to make sure my code compiles. OK, so first check that I can do, no matter what method, is I should probably check if a dot size is equal equal to, sorry, if, they, if these two sizes are not equal, b dot size. Again, my font does weird things where, or weird slash awesome things, where basically it's saying, taking the exclamation point and the equal sign, and then the ligature function in my font simply connects those things, much like how if you are working in a Word document, F, if you put an F and, I, and then an I, like in finish, the top of the F might go over the dot on the I. That's kind of a ligature fun function in, fo in fonts. Um, so, um, so if they, have, if they don't match in size, then they can't be permutations, so return false. All right, and so now I'm thinking, okay, I'm just going to sort these guys, collections dot sort A, then collections dot sort B. And also notice I'm not really set, setting anything equal to each other. It's a void method uh, because collections dot sort does affect A. It affects the thing I'm, it actually, it doesn't give me a new list. It sorts it internally, right? Which is, that's important to know, right? whether or not I'm getting a new list or not. And these methods will tell you, and actually documentation built in, but look, I pass it in here, and it's not working. Right? It was working here, but it's not working here. All right, required type, list T. I provided list E. Oh, OK. Maybe, I, maybe it cares what the letter is. No, that's not the answer, but I'm going to show you anyway. That's not, it doesn't care. So still going to say expect required type, list T, provided list T. What? what? And, and reason, no instance of the variable types T exists so that T conforms to comparable question mark super T. What in the, what on God's green earth? Um, so what's going on here is, is that if we look at collections.sort, which I'm going to do now, open it up and look at the documentation. All right. And the documentation may be a bit hard for you to read, but what it says is that if you look over here, the sort method takes in a list of t's, and then the generic argument is way more complicated, right? And what it's saying is that all sorts all listed uh, sorts the specified in a list into ascending order according to the natural ordering of its elements, which links to the comparable interface, which I'll get into in a second. But what that means in natural ordering is that that's a that's a term from from algebra, which basically says that items have an ordering. Right there are some items that you can compare two items and say one is smaller, one is larger, or one is e or they're both the same item. Make sense? So, or that one comes before another because if I'm sorting words, right, it doesn't make sense to say that, you know, how that works. So, for instance, when I sort words, typically I want to sort them in alphabetical order, not by size, right? So, it expects things to be comparable. Now, what the heck is comparable? Comparable is just an interface, which means that a bunch of things can, uh, can implement it. And it has just one method. Compare to. 
Okay? So anything, so pretty much, so first let me get this out of the way. You've been working with comparables all, all this time, all the integers, all the strings, all the capital D doubles are comparable objects. Anything that can be sorted by necessity is a comparable object. So the compare to method takes in one of the uh, two of those things um, and well, it just takes in a method and it takes in a, a, an other thing that you want to compare it to. So let's go ahead and see how that works over here. Like I said, things are comparable, so there's nothing stopping me from doing this over here. So in x, so here I'm going to do integer x is equal to 5. Integer y is equal to 7. All right, and now I can set out x dot compare to y, just so you understand what's going on here. So the way it works is that, I've, uh, is that I will get a negative number if I'm comparing something to a bigger thing. So if x is, le is smaller than y, I will get a negative number. Come on, you can do it. I didn't want to, I wanted to, oh, I hit the debug button, not the run button. So you see I get negative one, right? Because x is smaller than y, right? If they are the same, I get a zero back. Okay, and if the first thing is, if the thing that I'm doing, I'm calling compared to, to on is bigger, you survived the trip. So one, we get a positive number. So, so that's pretty cool. We can, and again, I mentioned that strings are also comparable. So first off, notice that be, just because these are both things that are comparable to each other, I can't, sorry, just because they are com both comparables, I can't call compare to on a string to an integer because they're not comparable to each other. That's what, the, what this is say, saying over here, that you have to compare to another thing of the same type as you. Make sense? So apple dot compare to banana, we are going to get apple comes before banana, so we get a negative number. If I say zebra, I'm also going to get a negative number, but I'm going to get a different negative number, which is 25. Sorry, negative 25. And that's because A is 25 letters before Z. So you can put additional information in if you so choose. Yes? Um, be, yeah, because you don't, you can't call methods on primitives, and you don't need to because you can just use less than and greater than. But, so this is a way of using less than or greater than on these objects. So that's something that Python has that uh, Java does not. Um, the ability to use primitives like uh, in a much more uh, in these kind of operations. Um, so anyway, things have to be comparable if you want to sort them. So, collections.sort, like we did over here, that's not going to work with our E, because the E's could be anything, including scanners, and how in the world would you be, compare scanners to each other, right? So the only way to get around this is by enforcing that the E's, that, that these E's that we are passing in are going to be comparable. And we do that by saying that by by doing this, by enforcing an is a relationship. And you enforce is a relationships with the extend keyword, even though it's an interface. Just deal with it. Um, so what I just typed here fixed that compilation issue. And what I just typed here said that, OK, there are a bunch of E's. There are a bunch of E's. 
I should probably highlight because you're going to probably be referencing this later. There's a bunch of E's here. And what I'm saying is that these E's are comp I'm enforcing that any E's you pass in, they have to be comparables. So they have to be integers, or they have to be strings, or they have to be capital D doubles. Furthermore, this E over here says not only are they comparable, but they're comparable to each other and only to each other, right? Now, you may have gone, wait a second, in the collections though, they did this question mark super T, which is a bit more than I want to get into, but briefly, that what's that saying is that it's comparable to anything, that's the wild card over here, anything that has, that has T as a parent class. So in other words, if, in other words, you could say, uh, if, if it was a subclass of E, we could compare it to that as well. But generally, this is all you need. And this is all you need to solve the is permutation if you want to use the sorting method. Pretty cool, right? However, say you want to do it, you know, the first way, because you want to also check if, the, if they're permutations of each other, even if you can't sort them, right? This works, by the way. Oh, right. I'm not actually done here. You have to also return, um, you have to return uh, a dot equals b, which would check, are they now the same list? Right? Because remember, if you sort things, they're the same. So what about the other way to do it now? So let me comment this out so you can wildly cop copy it down if you need to. Um, I've done like multiple versions of this in the GitHub uh, repository for previous classes. So if you need a copy, you can find it there. But let's try this again. But this time we're going to do it the painful way. The way that where we don't mess with generics. So again, I'm going to assume true over here. And again, I wanted to capitalize true because I am, again, also teaching Python at the same time which capitalizes true and false, and I can never remember now which, length, which does which. It happens, don't worry about it. It will happen to you, just let, letting you know that that is a normal thing to not remember those kind of things. And so, you know, if you wrote that on a paper test, I'm definitely not gonna penalize you. Um, I do plan on our test being electronic, though, because that's much easier for us to grade and stuff. And plus, I don't have to worry about the cats like jumping onto my exams and then having a massive hairball on one of them. True story. That was a fun. That was a fun uh, explanation to a student. Um, anyway, so A size, B size. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through. Now, I, at this point, if I hit line 27, I know that both these things are the same size. So this way, the way I'm going to do it now is I'm just going to count the number of occurrences that, the, that, that each of them happen. So for every item in A, I'm going to count the number of times it happens in A, and then count the number of times it happens in B. So first, I'm going to write a for each loop. So for E, for e every item, so E item in A. Gosh, I love for, uh, for each loops. They make it so much easier to do that. So for every items in A, I'm going to say, Set up a count a is equal to zero, int count b is equal to zero. Yes, I know I technically have seen that item once right now, but I'm, I'm not going to overcomplicate my code with some if statements. I want to make it pretty direct. Um, so now for every item in a, so, for, so I've set up a count a and a count b. And, at the, and I'm going to count the number of times it occurs in this loop. Sorry, it occurs in A. So for, and here I'll just do regular for loops. So for item for int i is equal to 0, i is less than a dot, because it feels wrong to do a for each loop in a for each loop. It just feels wrong. So for int a is equal to dot size. Yeah, so another quirk about languages 
um, this is one of the things I hate about Java. With Python, it's easy. You just say len, and it gives you the size of something. For Java, it is dot length with no parentheses for an array, dot length with parentheses for a string, and then dot size for everything else with parentheses. So I understand why it's like that for the dot size, but still it's just painful and dumb. Okay. I do love Java. It's great. But that's painful at the same time. So um, if um, a dot get i equal equals our item. Sorry, no. Remember, I mean, technically that would probably work, but we should do dot equals. Item, right? So if the item I'm currently looking at at index i is equal to the item I'm counting up, right? In that case, count a plus plus. And even though these are like single, uh, single line statements, I do like to use the curly braces in there just so that there's, in, in just so that, I always like to use curly braces because otherwise I can lead to pain. Um, if, you, if you don't, then it will only trigger the next line, which can be very painful. All right, next, we just do the same thing but for B. So all these instances I'm going to switch to B which isn't that painful. So this is a very unusual for loop structure, right? One that we've rarely used here, where basically I'm going through one, and then I'm going through the same one as well as a different one, but it's not like triple nested. It's still just a singly nested loop. I just happen to have two loops inside the nest. Okay, but it made sense when I was explaining it. So now if count a and count b differ, return false. We can just say, oh, if these two items don't occur the same amount of times, they're not permutations of each other. And that's all I need. And then, so that is it for that code. Because since they're the same size, that means that if they're the same size, then I only have to check, I only have to do this loop once. I don't have to do for each item in b as well. And the reason for that is that if B has a different item than A does, then the counts of one of the other items is gonna be off because they are the same size, right? So they can't have differing items, otherwise we'll detect that. So the only thing we have to worry about is differing amounts, and if they have the same items but differing amounts of the items, we'll detect that with a loop. Make sense? So it's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing an additional check, but you just don't need to. And this co code is already annoyingly long. So yeah. And I can now at this point also remove this, this extends co comparable, which is great if I needed to. So that's how you would solve this permutation. Feel free to use either of those as your answer, by the way, for that problem. This is one of those that ones that I wanted to solve in class. Uh, sorry, I wanted you to try to solve, but I also, wanted to solve it and show you how to solve it because it's one of the more painful ones to do. Um, there is, other than this way, which is the extends comparable E, there's no like nice, concise, pretty way to solve it, except now we have to put a restriction on, on the type. It doesn't work for every type, right? It only works for comparables. Now, there is a more efficient way to solve it this, act, this, as you'll learn in part three, takes O of n squared time, meaning that the, that the amount of time this takes is quad, has a quadratic relationship with the amount of items you pass in. So if I pass in, so if I pass in four items, expect a 16, kind of 16 steps worth of stuff. If I pass in 10 items, expect 100 steps kind of relationship here. Okay, yes? Can you explain again why so, so right now it can be, with the way I did it, I can do this and we're not going to get any errors. I think. Yeah, we're not going to get any errors. 
It's only going to be a, using that if we have to use. I just didn't change that. We only need the E extends comparable E if there's if we're going to be sorting them. And the reason for that is that in order for it to sort something, the things have to be able to be put in an order. They have to have some kind of ordering. In order to force the or, enforce an ordering, anything that can be put in order in Java is a comparable. So this says that anything that gets passed into this method has to be a comp has to be comparable. Meaning they have the compare to function, which means that the, we can sort them using the sort method. There's a second sort method, by the way, for things that aren't comparable to each other. By the way, um, but if you'll notice, if you pass in something called comparator to it. And what that does is that you're saying that I, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a built-in way of using compare to, but I, with the comparator, I've defined some, you build a comparator to say, I, here's how you sort these two things. If you have two items, this is how you tell which one should go before the other. Um, so like, again, scanners don't have compare to built into them, but say if you want to sort scanners by the time they were created, or by their memory address, you could do that. So, yes? If you left out the uh, next comparable, would you try to compare them to different types? I think so. You'd get a warning. Okay. You get a warning because, um, see, I got a light bulb saying that you're using raw comparables. <laughs> so, this just, pr this just simply knocks out that warning. Okay. Because, and you're right, it would be trying to compare to, you would be seeing E's compared to anything, which, because in comparable, that would just simply replace the T with object as opposed to the same type. Okay. No worries. All right. Um, all right, so that's what I've got for you lecture wise. Um, I was recording, so I'll stop recording now.